Before machines could think, someone had to teach them to understand. In the early 1950s, programming was an act of endurance. Every command was a number, every idea reduced to code that only a machine could understand. And soon, the power to translate that code would become one of the most controversial powers in computing. Each program was a fragile structure, woven tightly from thousands of small dependencies. Change one instruction, and the entire system could collapse. This was the programmer's burden, a world where the smallest mistake could cost weeks of debugging, and where the act of creation was buried under mechanical detail. Early attempts to escape this tedium produced interpreters, systems like speed coding and short code. They offered small conveniences, floating point arithmetic, simplified operations, but the humans still carried most of the cognitive load. They didn't change what programming was. They only made it slightly less painful. What was needed wasn't a shortcut. It was a translator. In 1951, inside the Navy's computing division at Remington Rand, Grace Murray Hopper began to build exactly that. Her machine was the Univac-1, a room-sized computer humming with vacuum tubes and cables. Her goal wasn't to make it smarter. It was to make it listen. The system she designed, called the A0, or arithmetic language version, was wasn't a compiler in the modern sense. It didn't translate entire programs written in English or algebra. It worked from symbolic instructions, sequences of subroutine names and their arguments, and turned them into executable machine code automatically. For the first time, a programmer could describe what needed to happen, without specifying every physical step of how. This small act of automation carried a larger idea, that programming could be abstracted, that machines could fill in the routine, and humans could focus on the logic that mattered. The A0 evolved. By 1953, Hopper's team released the A2 system, and in a radical move, they shared its source code with customers. Users were encouraged to modify it, improve it, and send their updates back to Univac. It was a quiet moment of collaboration that foreshadowed the culture of open source decades before the term existed. Soon after came Flowmatic, a new kind of language, written not in symbols or algebra, but in English words. Its commands read like plain sentences. Transfer A to B. Red item file. The design was intentional. Flowmatic wasn't built for scientists. It was built for the business world. For accountants, analysts, and operators who understood process, not circuitry. By lowering the barrier to understanding, Hopper shifted the center of gravity in computing. The machine no longer demanded fluency in its own language. It began to meet the human halfway. The compiler was born from exhaustion, speaking in numbers. It was, and still is, the quiet architecture beneath all digital creation, the invisible translator that turned the chaos of binary into the language of possibility. This video is co-presented by CodeRabbit, an AI platform redefining how developers write, review, and refine code, brought to you by CodeSource. Subscribe for more documentaries like this. By the mid-1950s, computers had grown faster, but the human mind had not. What Grace Hopper had glimpsed with A0, the idea that humans could speak in their own terms and let the machine handle the rest, was about to be tested at scale. In 1954, at IBM, a mathematician named John Backus proposed a radical idea. He wanted to create a language that could express mathematical formulas directly, no registers, no addresses, no assembly mnemonics. And he wanted a compiler that could make those high-level statements run as fast as handwritten machine code. It sounded impossible. Even engineers inside IBM doubted it could be done. One colleague later said, people didn't think computers could write programs that good. But Bacchus insisted. He assembled a small team, Alan Perlis, Roy Nutt, Dick Goldberg, and others, who began to design what they called the Formula Translation System, or Fortran. Unlike Hopper's compilers, which focused on linking subroutines, the Fortran compiler would take entire algebraic expressions, something like this, and turn it into efficient machine instructions for the IBM 704. To do that, the team had to build something the world had never seen before. A compiler that could analyze logic, optimize it, and generate code as good as a human engineer. The 1957 Fortran compiler was a triumph of both software engineering and faith. It took more than two years and roughly 18 person years of labor to complete. At a time when software engineering wasn't even a phrase, its success proved that automatic programming wasn't fantasy. It was computation elevated through abstraction. Bacchus later explained the motivation. We wanted to free the programmer from the tedium of hand coding and let him concentrate on the problem itself, but freedom carried a quiet cost. Fortran's compiler made programming faster, but also more opaque. For the first time, the code humans wrote and the code machines executed began to drift apart. Trust in the compiler became an act of faith, 
That freedom came from a crucial architectural insight, the division of analysis and synthesis. The compiler would first understand the structure and meaning of the source language, then synthesize equivalent machine code. Between the two sat an invisible bridge, the intermediate representation, a neutral form of logic that could be optimized and retargeted to different machines. That separation became the backbone of modern compiler design. It allowed new languages to emerge without rebuilding the entire machinery from scratch. By the early 1960s, this philosophy began to crystallize into theory. Researchers like Peter Nahr, John McCarthy, and Robert Floyd started treating compilers not just as engineering artifacts, but as formal systems. Parsing algorithms were grounded in the mathematical structure of context-free grammars, first articulated by Noam Chomsky. This turned programming languages into objects of rigorous study, things that could be reasoned about, verified, and improved. The field now had rules. As compilers matured, they began to do more than translation. They started to optimize. Early Fortran compilers performed constant folding, loop unrolling, and algebraic simplification, ideas that would later define the science of code optimization. What began as a mechanical convenience became an economic engine. Make the code smaller, run it faster, use less memory. Optimization was no longer a trick, it was a competitive advantage. Yet even in this age of abstraction, the principle Hopper had planted remained. By the end of the decade, the act of programming had transformed. No longer a ritual of switches and wires, it was a language-driven collaboration. Human ideas expressed in structured logic, translated by software into mechanical action. And as the 1960s gave rise to new languages, Algol, COBOL, Lisp, each carried the same inheritance. The belief that abstraction was not escape, but precision. A way to reason about complexity, without being crushed by it. By the late 1960s, computers had become a field of languages. But as software grew, the discipline began to bend under its own weight. Programs had become too large to manage intuitively. Errors crept in from the smallest ambiguities, mismatched parentheses, misplaced scopes, inconsistent meanings. If the compiler was to remain the bridge between idea and execution, it needed a theory that could guarantee its correctness. That shift from craft to science began in universities and research labs. In Copenhagen, Peter Null, a member of the Elgol committee began describing programming languages not as lists of features but as formal grammars. At MIT, John McCarthy treated them as symbolic systems, governed by logic. No longer ad hoc or intuitive, but structured, rule-driven, and provable. Across the 1970s, this mindset spread. At Stanford, Donald Knuth turned compiler construction into a textbook discipline, transforming tricks of the trade into formal algorithms. Parsing became a science. Techniques like LL parsing and LR parsing emerged, systematic methods for reading code from top down or bottom up, each guaranteeing deterministic understanding. What had once been handcrafted intuition was now a field of proofs, tables, and automata. But these developments weren't only academic. They were born from necessity. Software had escaped the laboratory. Now it ran banks, airlines, governments. One logical flaw could ripple across entire economies. Predictability mattered. Formalism was survival. Yet even formal proofs could not guarantee purity. In 1984, Ken Thompson demonstrated the unthinkable, that a compiler could be programmed to insert malicious code into every program it built, even into itself. His reflections on trusting trust talk exposed a paradox. You could never fully trust the machine that taught all others to speak. And yet, even within this new science, there was artistry. Compiler engineers began to speak of the front end and back end, a design philosophy that separated understanding from execution. This division was elegant. Out of that symmetry grew something more profound, the idea of machine independence. A compiler could now be retargeted. Write one front end for your language, and you could adapt it to any hardware by swapping out the back end. In a world of rapidly evolving architectures, this was liberation. At Bell Labs, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie would later use this principle to rewrite the Unix operating system in C, a language that could be compiled anywhere. It was an act of intellectual portability, made possible by the very abstraction Hopper had pioneered decades earlier. But independence carried its own irony. Decades later, Intel's proprietary compilers were found to favor their own processors, deliberately optimizing code to run faster on Intel chips and slower on competitors. The translator had learned to play favorites, and performance itself became political. Still, the compiler remained an enigma to most who used it. Programmers wrote their code and trusted the machine to understand. But beneath that trust lay one of the most intricate forms of automation humans had ever built. A structure capable of recognizing meaning, optimizing logic, and generating performance that even experts struggled to match by hand. They even modeled the use of CPU registers as a mathematical problem, 
one so complex it was proven NP-complete, meaning there could be no perfect universal solution. Instead, compilers relied on heuristics, approximations, algorithms that searched for good enough answers in the infinite space of possibility. This was the new face of computing. A domain where mathematics met pragmatism, and beauty was measured in efficiency. By the 1980s, compiler research had matured into architecture. Systems like LLVM's ancestors and GCC embodied decades of accumulated logic. The compiler had become modular, layered, and deeply introspective, a system that could reason about itself, restructure itself, and even generate better versions of its own output. In that evolution, something fundamental had shifted. Early programmers had written for machines, then they wrote for compilers. Now they wrote for languages, abstract environments that transcended hardware altogether. The compiler had quietly inverted the hierarchy. The human no longer served the machine. The machine now served the abstraction. And through it all, the goal remained unchanged. To translate human logic into reliable action. From Hopper's A0 to Bacchus's Fortan, from Knuth's Parsers to Thompson's C. The story of the compiler is not one of automation replacing human skill, but of human intellect extending itself, building tools to reason faster, deeper, and at scale. Every algorithm that runs today from a smartphone app to a neural network still passes through the same invisible architecture. It is passed, optimized, and transformed by the silent machinery born from that original insight. That understanding is mechanical, but meaning is human. By the late 1980s, the compiler had vanished, not in importance, but in visibility. It had become part of the machine itself. Developers no longer thought about it directly. They typed code, pressed build, and watched the result appear. But inside that quiet moment, billions of rules still unfolded. The architectures had multiplied. Mainframes, mini-computers, workstations, and soon, personal computers. Each new system demanded its own dialect of machine code. And yet through it all, compilers had learned to adapt. The abstraction barrier, that invisible layer separating human intent from silicon, had held firm. In 1987, Richard Stallman's GCC became the first widely used open-source compiler system. It wasn't just software, it was infrastructure. For the first time, developers could inspect, modify, and optimize the very machinery of translation. A compiler was no longer a black box owned by corporations, it became a living collaborative artifact. GCC's modularity, its separate front ends for different languages and back ends for different architectures, embodied the engineering ideal of reusability. It encoded decades of compiler wisdom, lexical analysis, parsing, intermediate representation, optimization, and code generation. It also democratized them. Students, researchers, and companies all built on the same foundation. The compiler had become an ecosystem. Then came the next leap, JIT compilation, or just in time. Instead of translating code once and freezing it into machine language, the compiler began to act dynamically, watching programs as they ran, optimizing them in real time. Languages like Java, and later JavaScript, turned this idea into mainstream practice. The line between compilation and execution blurred. The machine could now learn how to run your program better, while it was running. This required new kinds of intelligence. JIT, profiled code paths, tracked usage patterns, and selectively recompiled hotspots to improve speed. It was compilation as adaptation, an evolving conversation between the program and the processor. In the early 2000s, a new project reframed what a compiler could be, LLVM. Its architects Chris Latner and Vikram Adve envisioned it not as a single program but as a set of reusable compiler components, a flexible infrastructure that could support everything from research experiments to production-grade languages. LLVM broke the monolith apart. It introduced a clean, language-agnostic intermediate form, a kind of universal logic that any language could emit and any hardware could consume. C, Swift, Rust, Kotlin, Julia, all of them owe part of their power to LLVM's architecture and it allowed old languages to live again, recompiled, optimized, reborn for new machines. Only now, it did so invisibly, distributed across tool chains, virtual machines, and cloud infrastructure. Today, the compiler's reach extends beyond software. It builds firmware for autonomous vehicles, configures neural networks, and generates optimized machine instructions for GPUs running deep learning models. The same ideas that powered Hopper's A0 now govern billions of lines of code executed every second across the planet. And in a quiet way, the compiler has become the central metaphor of computing itself. To compile is to translate, but also to compress, to take something complex and render it precise. Every domain that involves translation between ideas, data, or hardware has adopted compiler-like thinking, modular, layered, incremental, and abstract. 
The story that began in a Navy lab with Grace Hopper feeding symbolic instructions to a univac now continues across data centers and neural accelerators. Every app, every simulation, every algorithm runs because somewhere in the background, a compiler transformed human expression into machine action. The compiler endures not as a relic, but as the architecture of thought, a system born from human impatience, refined by logic, and perfected by time.